So I'm just going to start talking about basic statements. Unless there are any questions, <laughs> whatever happened before, or anything like that. Okay. So um, right. So I mean, chapter five is all about basic statements. But I'm, you know, I'm going to go into some of the stuff that I didn't get to at the end of chapter four too, because that's also really about basic statements. <laughs> so, um, so basic statements are, I mean, they're sort of like protocol sentences or observation sentences. I mean, they're the statements that are going to be used in testing scientific theory. And actually, they have two different purposes. So this is, I don't remember if I got to this at all at the end last time, or anyway, if I did at all, it was only very briefly. So we need basic statements. Prop that is proper needs basic statements to explain um, both falsifiability and falsification. But it's not the same basic statements, and they're not used in the same way. So, um, right, so for falsifiability, you need to compare a theory to all the possible basic statements. And then, you know, so we need to see, like, does it, does it rule any of them out? If it rules some of them out, then it's falsifiable. I mean, of course, we always have to keep in mind, like, what the, all the other stuff that I spent most of last time talking about, like, just because the theory is falsifiable, doesn't guarantee that you're using it, or, you know, in a way that makes it falsifiable, right? It just means that logically speaking, you could. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, so that's one way he needs um, basic statements. But for, for falsification, you need actual or that is accepted basic statements. Right, because to this, you know, if the theory is all actually going to be falsified, it can't be falsified by a possible basic statement. It has to be falsified by something we've actually observed, which um, translates as by by a basic statement that we've that we've agreed to accept as true. And like, who is we? Well, um, um, we is like the scientific community. See, see I said I, I said this lecture wouldn't be very political, but there is something political. <laughs> the scientific community, you know, like that is excluding cranks, for example. Um, because you know there are there are all these people I don't know about these but there are often people like this in this they start off as respectable members of the scientific community and then you know their favorite theory gets rejected by almost everyone and they keep trying to defend it and eventually you know so like this happened with um, um, Big Bang cosmology, where for a while there was a big, there was a, there was a serious question among uh, cosmologists whether the Big Bang was the right way to go or a steady state theory of the universe. And eventually, basically, everyone decided that the Big Bang theory was the way to go. But there were like you know a few people who were like, no, no, you know, I can still explain this using the steady state hypothesis. And like we you know what happens to them, well, they don't get like burnt at the stake or something. They just 
after a while, they'll get a lot of grad students and <laughs> you know, whatever. So, but right, so so but I mean, so there but, so there is some kind of you know um, whenever we say that this is a matter of convention, that means there is some kind of political issue here. I think Lakatosh is gonna see like it emphasizes that more in his description of what Popper is doing, and then I guess it might be worth thinking about why Popper wouldn't want to emphasize it that much. But in any case, right, so we have these actual accepted basic statements. That's what we're going to use to falsify the theory. But then it's important to remember, again, that, you know, Popper keeps complaining. This is part of the myth about him. But he said, so for this, for falsifiability, you just have to find one possible basic statement that the theory rules out. And there's never just going to be one. <laughs> If there's one, there's going to be infinitely many for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. But you don't have to, you just have to find one and the theory is falsifiable. But for falsification, Popper says, it's you know certainly not true that any time you have any observation report that's accepted that contradicts the theory, you throw out the theory. I mean, it's it's not true when he says it's you know not methodologically correct. Um, so, um, so, you know, what really leads to falsification, according to Popper, is acceptance of a falsifying hypothesis. So, um, I mean, I'm going to say more in a moment about what the falsifying hypothesis is and uh, what it takes to get one and whatever. But, it, but basically, a falsifying hypothesis is a hypothesis that explains the falsifying observation, um, whereas the theory that we're testing doesn't. But um, it's not, it's different from a single falsifying observation because other people can test it. So, um, All right, so like I said, I'll say more about I'll say more about both of those things. I think I need to go back to this one first and then come back to this one. But are there questions so far about this? I mean, I think it's fairly straightforward, but I know that people sometimes get confused by it, and um, maybe even some of Popper's critics get confused by it. So um, at least he certainly thinks they have. Um, so, um, so this is kind of, I mean, I kind of did go through the, what I wanted to do is go again through the logical situation with, the, with falsifiability of the theory. You know, and again, keeping in mind that the logical structure that that we call falsifiability is not the whole story about the method, but it is necessary to apply the method. And so, you know, you have a theory, well, before I use P and Q, but in these notes I'm using A and B. Where you have, in general, your theory contains statements like this, where x refers to spatiotemporal, x ranges over spatiotemporal positions. Um, and it's um, the fact that it says something about every spatiotemporal position is what makes it strictly universal. Or, well, I mean, Yes and no. I, 
Okay, again, you can't tell from the logical form whether it's the universal. Right, that is P, I could say P is something like is on my desk. <laughs> and then this says, you know, any spatial temporal location, if the thing at that location is on my desk, then. And so, um, so like according to its form, it looks strictly universal, but it's not strictly universal because it only makes any predictions within a certain spatial temporal region. All right, so um, I mean, yeah, this is kind of a common theme throughout proper. You need a certain logical form, let's say, but you know, the logical form by itself won't guarantee that you're, that you're doing the right thing. You have to have the right intention. Um, so, um, right, so like I said before, P might be, might say that the thing at X is a swan, and Q might say that it's white, and then this theory says that all swans are white. I mean, I don't know, it did go through all of this before. I still think it's worth saying more. So, Right, so the, so the theory, you know, um, the type of, thing, of singular statements that the theory directly implies are things like this. I guess I've switched from the implication side. I think that's fine. Where I was using this one. All right. So, right, so like, if, it forbids if the thing at A is a swan, or sorry, it implies if the thing at A is a swan, the thing at A is white. And, um, right, or in other words, it predicts that either the thing at A is white or it's not a swan. So the theory only implies, I think this is maybe what I didn't say clearly enough before, but I want to say it a little more clearly now. The theory only implies anything at places where there are swans. But the theory doesn't imply that there are any swans. Right? So like this is true if there are no swans. Anyway. And that's why the theory by itself doesn't imply any. It doesn't imply anything observable because it implies a, a, a possible observation only in places where there are swans, but it doesn't predict that there will be swans. So it, it by itself, it doesn't say anything. You need the initial condition, right? So in this case, the initial condition, or again, in German, he actually calls it a boundary condition. I mean, Right, so like, I mean, he's thinking about something like this, like, um, um, like, if you say, um, Or maybe call this height, right? So, like the derivative of height with respect to the time is minus g, right? That means that's like the law of fall in a uniform gravitational field. So, you know, so like the solution um, is going to look something like. So, 
right? Meaning that this law doesn't tell you anything about the height unless you plug in what the height was to begin with and what the velocity was to begin with. Right? That's what, so like those are the kind of singular statements that in real scientific laws are the initial conditions or boundary conditions. Okay, so I mean, um, but in this simple example, the boundary condition or initial condition is just that there's a swan egg. Right, that's the singular statement we need to feed into the theory to get a definite prediction. Um, so, um, or to put it differently, you know, but to put it in a positive way, the theory does imply certain things, but only on a condition. So given the boundary condition of PA, it does imply QA. And um, for the theory to be um, empirical, PA, P and Q are going to have to be observable predicates. Um, and a basic statement is a statement like this, which attributes an observable predicate to a certain spatiotemporal relation uh, location. Um, so that's how um, so that's how the definition of all possible basic statements comes into the definition of falsifiability. For theory to be falsifiable. Theory of this form, right? Remember, I said it before, like we don't mean we don't usually talk about theories like this, <laughs> right? Like you know, for like pretty few in here, everything is white, <laughs> right? Like that's, I mean, uh, there are no theories that say that a certain observable predicate holds everything. Um, why not? And so, like, Popper doesn't even discuss this. So, you know, but why not? Well, you know, um, as I said before, like, if you think about Hume's example, where he says that, like, every single um, uh, spatial point we had ever seen was purple, um, we wouldn't, like, abstract the quality of purple from right and we just like a purple point would be a point <laughs> so like i mean i think in some sense there could be observable practical points um, but anyway uh, leaving that aside because like i said Popper doesn't discuss it assuming that your theory is in this form then uh um, the test for falsifiability is that these have to be observable predicates. And if these are observable predicates, then the theory will predict certain observations on certain conditions. Um, and if the theory predicts certain observations on certain conditions, then, it, then it, although it doesn't by itself imply any basic statements, it will by itself forbid certain basic statements. Right, so as Popper says, like this, you know, the, the first pass, or well, I mean, not the first pass, because it turns out to be exactly right. But like, if you start thinking about what it means that the theory is empirical, first you might think, oh, the theory implies certain observable results, meaning basic statements in this sense. But then you realize, no, that's not the kind of theory uh, we have or want the kind of theory we have pre predict certain basic certain basic statements on the condition of other basic statements, which we call the initial conditions. Um, and like to make that more precise, you can say like you have to be able to derive from this plus the theory more than you could derive from this by itself. In this case, the new thing you can derive is Q. 
right? So that's what makes the theory empirical, that it, um, it allows you to generate new predictions out of your old observations. You have some basic statements and you can use the theory to crank out new ones. Um, but then he points out, this is the exact same criterion as falsifiability. Because if the theory indeed forbid, uh, implies certain basic statements on the condition of other ones, then that means that it um, predicts that you won't see this. You won't see a swan that's not white. I remember I showed before, like using De Morgan's law or whatever. Why these are all, you know, these are all like logically equivalent formulations. But you know, so so the point is that um, this is what the theory implies. This is not a basic statement. Again, this is equivalent to this is equivalent. These two are equivalent. And this we know is not a basic statement because again, it does not predict anything. So, or, I mean, because again, it's, uh, it doesn't say anything except at places where there are swans. So, um, um, so this also is not a basic statement, but this inside is a basic statement. Now, I mean, how can you, like, Popper doesn't give an overall rule for telling actually what logical combinations of basic statements are or are not basic statements. I, I guess you're just supposed to think about it. <laughs> I mean, but like, um, this says there is a swan of A and it's not what. Um, so whatever A is, this tells you something about it. Whereas this tells you nothing about A unless there's a swan there. Right? Yeah, no, that's right. This, right, because this, this doesn't mean that there's a swan at A. It means if there's a swan at A, it's what? So it doesn't tell you anything about A unless there's a swan there, and it doesn't give you any reason to think there's a swan there. This tells you there is a swan there. And it's not so. This is an observation you could make. And again, I don't think uh, that he gives. Uh, I mean, he actually, he probably does somewhere, but not in this text. Give like a uh, really complete explanation of how you can tell which ways to put basic statements together to get new basic statements. But again, I think you're just supposed to think about it that way. You'll see which ones, you know, if this is a possible observation report, and if you if it's another possible observation report, then if you put them together this way, you get a possible observation report. So therefore, whenever, whenever a theory allows you, and you know, we don't even have to ask like what's inside the theory. If it just somehow allows us to get QA from PA and we otherwise couldn't have, then it forbids this, which we otherwise might thought we would see. So whatever theory allows you to do this is falsifiable. And vice versa. Uh, I don't know if it's worth showing. It's not complicated, but I don't know if it's worth showing vice versa. But it, you know, I mean, just basically, if the if the theory rules out that B is true at A, and this and, and B is an, an, an observable predicate, so B A is a basic statement, um, then Again, what the theory implies is not a basic statement, it's the negation of the basic statement. But you just take anything else that you know is true at A. Like, you know A is true at A. 
And now you know that the theory allows you to get this because the theory by itself implies this. <laughs> so using A, this plus the theory, you can get this. Right, so again, that shows that the theory rules out any basic statement. It also allows you to, to derive new predictions. Right, if you didn't call that, or, or it's just an interesting thing to about, but this is, I, I wanted to fill that in because last time I talked about this, I said that they were both the same, and then I stopped and asked, wait, I didn't show the other direction. <laughs> yeah. I think you mentioned that that stuff like basic statements are like singular expression statements and um, their conjunctions. How is it like different from, from what you were doing? Because I thought like I thought by doing that he demonstrated the logical structure of, of a basic statement has to be you know a singular basic statement and it, its conjunction. So how, is that not the logical form of basic statement? Or? Well, so the basic statement has to be a singular observable statement. Um, the conjunctions of them are also basic statements, but that's not only, but not only the conjunctions of them. This, I mean, he does mention this example, but he doesn't give a general rule. But he says sometimes the conjunction of a basic statement with something that's not a basic statement can get you a new basic statement. Uh -huh. And this is the type of example he talks about, right? Because so, like in general, the negations of basic statements are never basic statements. So if if this is a basic statement, then not this is not a basic statement. And yet when you can join it with this one, you do get a basic statement. So um, and I guess it's important that it's the same point. Uh, Right, so so I so I think the rule might be complicated, and, it, and, and like I said, it doesn't give a general rule. Um, but uh, anyway, this is the only case you really need for these purposes. So um, so like I mean. I guess, like, really the asymmetry here, the reason for the asymmetry here is that predicting something on a condition is not predicting anything. Um, but forbidding something on a condition is forbidding something. So, uh, um, so I think, you know, aside from the, the symbolism, whatever, if you think about it that way, because it can be, it's a little bit surprising to see that there's this asymmetry. But I, I think there really is. Um, okay, so, um, so, so none of this will work unless we know what the possible basic statements are. <laughs> So what are the possible basic statements? Well, I already said it. they have to have observable predicates. <coughs> or at least, I guess, the fun fundamental ones have observable predicates, and then you put them together in the right ways. But what's an observable predicate? And you know, so and this is another one of these places where, where Popper says, um, I can't tell you, I can't give you a definition of those observable predicates. Um, he says he can give explanations of it. Right? So first he gives what he calls a psychological explanation or a psychologistic explanation. And he's, you know, an observable predicate is one that a normal human being in you know normal circumstances can observe. <laughs> what you might think observable means, right? So uh, but he says, um, but I'm not tied to that psychologistic explanation of it. For example, I can give you a physicalistic explanation of it. it an observable basic statement is one that describes motions of macroscopic bodies. I'm not sure I understand how that second one is supposed to work, actually. I mean, because first of all, you might think macroscopic is psychologistic. I mean, you might think macroscopic, you know, 
as a hidden reference to us and our perceptual capabilities. Yeah. Seems like he's doing something like akin to like Carnap's kind of construction of the basis in his conceptual theory. Because he goes like, you know, you can really pick any form of like a base and it'll still be valid for construction of theory. So maybe he's trying to do something like that. I don't really see how the strategic of Carnap stands because Carnap also allows for the interchangeability of a basic a, a basic a basis for the construction system. Well, I, so I think, I mean, so compared to Carnap's original formulations in the Alpha and in the Unity of Science paper, I think this is really different. The question is, how different is from Carnap's formulation in his paper, Protocol Sentences, where he says, I'm adopting a suggestion that there was, you know, a idea that was suggested to me by Karl Popper. <laughs> So, like, I mean, first of all, it's not so surprising given he says that, but they become closer to each other at that point. But, um, but it's so, but it's, but it's different from Carnap before that, it's because before that, Carnap is saying, um, you know, we want to find out what the basic observational uh, terms are and how are we going to find out? We're going to ask psychology. Right, so he says that in the alpha, and he kind of still he doesn't in the unity of science paper he doesn't say exactly who is going to find this out. He says more research on the nature of the given is, is needed <laughs> before we can decide what form the protocol sentences will take. Um, um, whereas you know, so. Popper, I think, why does he say, I can't give you a definition, though I can give you an explanation? Because he doesn't think that these are really a special kind of predicate, that, that science could find out what they are. He thinks that these are the things that we agree that we'll accept as observation. And it might be different in different contexts, first of all. So it's right, it's like the things it's going to be convenient to, the kind of predicates it would be convenient for us to accept in observation reports. So, like, if we're all really used to using some complicated machinery to do something, some complicated apparatus, and we just like, you know, um, um, Take it for granted that everyone in our community knows how to use it right to measure or whatever. And we can take whatever, you know, like the dipole moment or, you know, or something as an observation. And we will probably. Right? So, like, you won't see, you know, scientific papers saying, um, uh, Abe's protocol at 3.45 p.m. At 3.45 p.m., Abe said to himself, I saw the pointer pointing to number two, right? <laughs> we'll just say, like, we observed the dipole moment to be... <laughs> and, and, and Popper is fine making that a basic statement. So, I mean, so, so therefore, the things I, I'm wondering about macroscopic, I mean, you know, maybe it's not that important, really, because it's not really tied to any of those explanations. But, but I, I mean, I do, I do wonder what he's thinking there. Both because, so, like, maybe macroscopic means doesn't refer to our perceptual capabilities, but it has to do with like the negligibility of quantum effects or something. I don't know. But I still like. What about is white? Is that about the motion of macroscopic bodies? So, yeah, I mean, so I'm not sure I understand, right? Like, I mean, we're not really mechanists. So, we, like, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, I think the main point is that um, this term observable doesn't need a definition, it needs a convention. Um, and Carnap does say in the protocol census paper, he says, you know, um, 
if we're gonna if we're gonna allow certain sentences of the system language to function as protocol sentences. I, I never talked about that paper very, very much today. I think I ran out of time to that. <laughs> but right, he has a, it's it's part of his response to Neuron, not Hopper, right? But he says, you know. Oh, okay. I understand what you're saying, Roy Rod. You're proposing that instead of what I wanted to do, we do this. And then he says, Oh, but I know a better way of doing what you're proposing as long as we're going to go that way. And the better way is Copper's way, which is that um, we just let whatever we want to have as a basic statement. <laughs> um, and then uh, um, well, and then what? So, like, to to explain that then what and how it might be different from Popper, I guess. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Yeah, so maybe I should come back to this to this question about how it's different because. This you asked, it's right, Ryan. How it's different from Carnap. Yeah, maybe I'll come back to it later if I remember. Because I want to say before I say that, I want to say more about how, like, how does this work epistemologically according to Popper? If you can plug in anything, how is this going to like guarantee that your theory is empirical in any way? <laughs> so um, before that. I wanted to talk about the logical situation with respect to falsification. So this is the logical situation with respect to falsifiability. Are there, are there questions about this before I go on? Okay, so falsification is So we start with the same thing, right? That the theory looks like this. And therefore, it rules out certain statements, like, for example, this, right? There's a swan here, and it's not white. It rules that out. But obviously, whenever it rules out something like this, because it's strictly universal, it's going to rule out everything else like this too. Right? So, I mean, in this case, it's, it's obvious just from how the theory is written that it's, you know, it's going to rule out everything like that for any value of this. Um, So this is what Popper is getting at in section 23, that complicated thing about like events and occurrences. Um, and uh, um, the choice of his terminology there is weird. Uh, the translation is good in the sense that the choice is weird in German too. <laughs> <laughs> but when you, you know he's calling uh, occurrence something like this, some way right, an occurrence is wait, I hope I don't have this backwards. Like a singular statement describes an occurrence, right? So this is an occurrence. I mean, it's an occurrence because again, A is a spatio-temporal point. So you know, this says at a certain place and time is a swan, and at that place and time it's not white. So that's like something that only happened once. Um, whereas an event is um, an occurrence generalized to all places and 
That's great. So, or no, sorry. Wait. Well, no, so okay, an advantage is something like this. It says, right, that now I'm going to get all that stuff because I should have gone with A and B. That's my shit, A and B. Because current because the proper uses P for as the name of events <laughs> and occurrences. So right, like he says, um, if this is an occurrence, then this is the corresponding event. So uh, this is the occurrence of a non-white swan being at A. This is the event of a non-white swan being somewhere. So an event, and like I said, I mean the word event doesn't really mean this, <laughs> right? But an event is like a type of occurrence, right? Like something that could happen in some spatio-temporal point, but I'm not saying which. Um, I mean, he also says you could define this as the class of occurrences that, you know, whatever. I, I mean, um, this, this is the main point. And then, um, No, okay, that's right. But actually, if you try to be event this way, just so maybe it is important that we define this as a class. It's like the class of events PX by So, um, right, so the point is. If the theory per, per, uh, forbids an occurrence, it always forbids the entire corresponding event. Um, so falsifiable theories, strictly universal falsifiable theories always forbid events. And there's that whole thing about the circle where the lines stand for events and whatever. I don't know if that's terribly helpful, but I mean, I could explain it if you want, but I think it's better not to think about it too much. But so, um, okay, so what does this have to do with falsifiability? Well, so um, if the theory rules out something like this, then for any predicate B, D, or let me call C. For any predicate C, it also rules out this. Right? It doesn't matter what C is, since this can't be true, the whole conjunction can't be true. And therefore, you know, so I guess actually, let me write this over here. Call this QA. Yes. So the theory also rules out this, and therefore it also rules out the event corresponding, the event Q. So, like, so for example, um, 
suppose C is the predicate is in Australia. If the theory rules out um, that there is a black swan at A, it also rules out that there is a black swan at A and A is in Australia. So if the theory rules out that there is a uh, by black, I mean not black, I, I, I shouldn't jump and say that they're black due to purple. But anyway, I mean the swans in Australia really are black, but <laughs> right, so you know if the um if, if the theory uh rules out the events there being a non-right swan, it also rules out the events. There being a non white swan in Australia. And so I can always form a hypothesis So, I mean, this is a hypothesis, that is, it's a guess, as Bob says, right? I, like, hypotheses are always guesses. Um, I can guess. I mean, so that is, in effect, what I'm guessing is that uh, the thing that made my theory go wrong is the fact that A is in Australia. Oh, I should just see this. Right, so this says for everything that is in Australia and is a swan, it's not. So whenever I have a falsifying observation, I can always generate a falsifying hypothesis. So given this falsifying hypothesis, I report what I've observed. I don't report that I've observed the occurrence PA, nor do I observe a point right, that is the occurrence non-white swan at A, nor do I report that I've observed the event non-white swan. I report that I've observed um, QA, non-white swan in Australia, which is an instance, so I say, I've, you know, observed that there are non-white swans in Australia. Yeah. So, like, the point is not, like, if I got this right, then every single, like, observation sentence can be, every single observation can be, like, divided into, like, an infinite amount of, like, you know, can add, like, conjunction DA or conjunction EA. As long as they have a, like the two prerequisites, like you can you can make a basic statement like any as many like uh, other predicates that you want as long as they have those two. So th then this way, the notion of the basic statement is still indeterminate kind of because there's no real um, necessary determination for it as long as it has the two uh, a a and b a and negation. Well, there's no right. So nothing forced me. That's why I said this is a guess. Nothing forced me to think of the of the what I observed this way. Right, I just arbitrarily added this. Now, arbitrarily, of course, like psychologically speaking, as Papa would say, it's not random, right? There's something that made me guess that. Um, but that's not a justification of whatever that is. That's just an explanation why that hypothesis occurred to me. Right, so in other words, it's not like really faced with the situation. We just try throwing in random predicates to see if they work. Something occurs to us as a falsifying hypothesis. Um, but logically speaking, yeah, this doesn't come from anywhere in the previous logical description of the situation. It just comes from nowhere. We're just guessing. Okay, I guess. Observe it. Uh, report that I've observed this event. 
now other people can go test whether I really did observe that event. <laughs> so it's, right? I mean, but it's whether I guessed right that that was the that was the issue. So if someone finds a white swan in Australia, my falsifying hypothesis is itself falsified. And so the theory is still fine, <laughs> right? So like I, you know, I say, hey, I observed a, a black swan in Australia. Um, so I think not all swans are white. And other people go to Australia and they say, we only found white swans in Australia. Um, so we're still going to go ahead and say all swans are white. Um, but if there really are a lot of black swans, eventually, at least the hope is, someone will reach a guess. I mean, there's no guarantee of this, right? As, as Popper says in a slightly different connection, he says, you know, if there came a point where scientists, like, couldn't agree, then that would be the end of science. <laughs> so, right? So, like, there's no guarantee. I mean, maybe we'll just try thing after thing, and all we'll be left with is these unexplained stray observations. You know, I saw a swan that's not white. I saw a swan that's not, that's not white, but there's no replicable effect. I could go on forever in principle. <laughs> but, um, uh, I mean, In a way, you could say then there's no science. In another way, you could say then there's no world, right? I mean, right? This, this would be pretty. That would have to be pretty chaotic. There's no pattern to when these observations come up. The next minute, someone looks back and it's white again, <laughs> right? So um, that you know that means that we just we're not sure what we're seeing. Um, Right, and this is also why Papa says that observations are necessarily theory laden, as he puts it. Right, he says like if someone tells you, gives you the order to sit down and write in your protocol everything you observe, you won't know what to write. You need a theory. This is an example, right? I mean, I don't know what events to report I saw. Unless I have some theory, which is basically a guess, at least logically speaking, a guess about what it was I saw. And that's another way of saying why, if, like, if this failed, it would mean that, yeah, there's no such thing as observations, right? Like, there's no way to know what to write down when you see something, because there's no theory. Of your, like, um, what about that should be universally generalizable? Um, or uh, uh, you know, as, as Kant might say, we have, we have no valid empirical concepts. <laughs> so we're, like we're not thinking about anything. Yeah. When you think of like the, the theoretical framework that determines which brackets to include in our observations, then it's become like a notion of like subjectivity, you know, kind of like reinsert subjective on like, on like why, whereas Popper still believes in like why the subjective should be um, kind of like reduced to, to both. I feel like the, like the way like the way it's kind of framed is if the, 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 the subjectivity, if the observation is theory then it implies that there's a subjective notion of, of how we interpret observation emphasis. I'm not sure. Well, so I mean, he does quote um, file. This is footnote four on page ninety-four. File. So this is uh, what's his first name? Uh, what? No more file. No, not file. File. <laughs> w. Y. L. Thinking Kurt Vile, probably Kurt. because when I came in here, it said three penny, penny opera on the board. But that, that's Kurt Vile. <laughs> this is the physicist Vile. What? Kermit. Yeah, 
yeah, I think that's right. Herman Weil. Yeah, right. So, um, right, so this is the quote from Herman Weil. Um, this pair of opposites, subjective, absolute, and objective relative, relatives, seem to me to contain one of those most profound epistemological truths which can be gathered from the study of nature. Whoever wants the absolute must get subjectivity, egocentricity into the bargain. And whoever longs for objectivity cannot avoid the problem of relativism. Blah, blah, blah. So, right, I mean, um, and he's quoting this approvingly, right? He's quoting Bio approvingly. Um, Bio is a pretty important physicist, but also someone who wrote about philosophy of physics. Um, you know, he's one of the architects of quantum mechanics. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Popper is saying, um, yeah, there is a, there is some kind of like interplay between subjectivity and objectivity here. You need the, I mean, in a way, Carnap says that too, right? Like, you need in the context of discovery. <laughs> Um, you say things and you don't know why. The difference is that, 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 that then Carnap says, but in the context of justification, you explain why. Whereas Popper says, there's no justification, it's just testing. In the context of testing, you, you subject your, sorry, it's an unfortunate word choice, but you subject your subjective, <laughs> Um, principle to objective tests and you want to give it up, right? So, like as I said, as I've been saying all along, the reason this is rational, this is like is the essence of rationality according to Popper is he, precisely he's saying that like whenever we believe things, it's always irrational. <laughs> um, so, what's the rational thing to do in that situation? Well, accept that you're going to believe things, but make sure that you can get out of them when they turn out to be false. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe somehow this contains Popper's response to Goodman. Right, like if you ask what you know, how do we know that it's green and blue and not blue and green and not uh, blue and green? The answer is we guess. <laughs> we must guess. Yeah. But uh, I read this like whole thing of like the natural selection of theories and kind of like being somewhat similar to good, like, you know, seeing which theories have have proven over time and, and whatnot. The theoretical framing for, for Popper, as as you told us, is still like subject to to the kind of like natural selection of, of, of theories over the course of, of power relations and whatnot. So 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 uh, I wouldn't would Popper in this line be kind of in line with Goodman or well Goodman, so I mean, and I pointed this out maybe too quickly when at the end of talking about Goodman, right? But Goodman's scheme is is super conservative actually, right? It's not it's not natural selection because there's no mechanism for eliminating. They just get more and more entrenched. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine that sometimes they get eliminated just, you know, because people, who knows why, stop using that predicate and then we'll get less entrenched. But there's never a justification for that in the system. Right? So that will, that, uh, like, call that a scientific revolution. It will always be basically irrational. Um, And so, I mean, even though Popper says it's all about statements, it's not about concepts because statements can be tested because they can be shown false and concepts can't. In a way, the, you know, the concepts are getting tested by this process. I never realized that completely before. We are guessing the concepts as well. 
and we and, and, and this shows how we can be caught out. Well, how we can be caught out. So I mean, again, only if first of all we like um, um, make a good faith effort to apply this map, right? Because if we if we want to hold on to our theory, we always can. And second of all, only if we find that we can agree with some community about what the true observation of those are. If we can't, there's going to be no way to do this. Um, I mean, I mean, I, and like, okay, so this is the answer to what you might think was a serious problem for Popper's view. So Popper says, like, it's rational to assert something about the world if it's falsifiable. Um, uh, well, okay, I mean, not actually, there's more than that. So it's rational to accept a theory. This, this still falls under falsification or attempted falsification. So, so far we have this theory, it's falsifiable. Um, we can see how it might be falsified. It's good because it's falsifiable. Um, but the question is, at what point do we claim this theory, make it our theory or accept it as Popper says. So accept it, like, Again, as I keep saying, psychologically, Popper agrees that when you accept a theory, you probably believe it's true. But, um, but that's not what acceptance means, right? Acceptance really is a decision that the scientific community has made to do something with this theory. And what they've decided to do with this theory is to like, um, well, um, I guess it's really two things, but the, they decided to use it to frame future observations, right? Because again, we need a theory to tell us how to do that. And they've also decided to make it the main focus of testing. This is the theory we're going to try to falsify. Um, so, um, and when do we? When do we count the theory as accepted? Or like, what are the criteria for, for accepting a theory in this sense, according to Popper? And the criterion is what he calls corroboration. Corroboration. So corroboration is, it's, it's, it, it always gives you an uneasy term or feeling when you see this in Popper, because it looks a lot like induction. Um, but corroboration means we accept the theory when it's passed a lot of severe tests. So, like to be a theory that's suitable for use in empirical science, there have to be possible tests. For be a theory that we're rejecting, there has to be failed tests, but not just one, but like a, 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 a falsifying hypothesis. Um, but to be a theory that's accepted, there have to be actual tests that have been passed. And we have to have been genuinely trying to test the theory. <laughs> so like, again, it comes back to like, I mean, this kind of a, uh, 
logical mechanism that allows you to do this, but ultimately you have you, you know it relies on us to use it properly. We have to be sincerely trying to test our theory. If we're sincerely trying to test our theory and applying the severest tests we can think about, and it keeps passing them, at some point we decide to accept this. At what point? When we all agree that it's enough. <laughs> um, what if we're wrong? That's not the right time to accept it. It's just a guess. <laughs> right? We're just guessing. So this is the theory to go with now. So as long as we all agree, that's good. <laughs> And Popper's recommend, so Popper is only recommending to us what we should look for before we make our agreement. Has it been sincerely tested and passed those tests? Okay, so I mean, that's the thing about corroboration and acceptance of theories. But what I was going to say seems like uh, a difficulty for him is that um, what about these basic statements? The basic statements haven't all been tested. On the contrary, we just accepted them on face value. So this is related to what Popper calls Fleece's trial. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so this guy, initial of J, F, I think, so like Johan Friedrich or <laughs> Jacqueline Friedrich or one of those names. Anyway, Fries, uh, is, uh, it was a kind of early 19th century ish, early to mid 19th century ish Kantian of a weird kind. Um, he was uh, um, wanted to build something like Kant's system, but on the basis of psychology, the basis of empirical psychology. Um, I mean, this that kind of naturalizing tendency was a big deal in the 19th century. Was, like, of course, at the very beginning of the 19th century, there was like Hegelians and stuff like that. But, you know, as the 19th century wore on in Germany, a lot of people became naturalists. <laughs> um, and yeah, he somehow was, was, I guess, was part of that movement. I have not read probably anything by him. Uh, and Popper, I, I was looking at, to see actually, because every year I'm like, I don't know what Fries actually says. But, you know, Popper footnotes his entire book. <laughs> he doesn't give a page number or anything. So, like, uh, I don't think I'm going to find it this year. Meanwhile, my kids were like, why are you Googling fries? <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, right, so Fries is just this guy, you know, I mean, also is one of the fathers of modern anti-Semitism, actually, but it never made that. <laughs> he wrote a whole book about the danger, you know, to Germans from Jews and how they should get rid of Jews and stuff. <laughs> All right, but in any case, uh, so, I, I, so I'm not sure whether this trilemma is, whether I'm still not sure whether proper is correctly attributing this trilemma to Fries or not. By the way, if you do Google Fries's trilemma, at least like from what I'm able to find, you basically find references to pop <laughs> or a reference to Fries, which is a copy, a copy of Popper's footnotes. <laughs> So, yeah, so this is kind of an open case. But in any case, what is Fries's trilemma according to Popper? Um, and you can see how this is related to psychology. So I'm sure there's something like this in Fries. 
So you might think that um, you should only accept a statement if you know a reason for it. That sounds like a good, like, rational rule. Don't accept anything unless you know a reason for it. That is, you might think you have to know something else that implies it's true. But free, at least according to Popper says, but look, statements are only implied by other statements. Um, right implication is the relationship between statements or propositions, not between like, I don't know, lemons and propositions. <laughs> right? Like you can't put a lemon in here. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> That's supposed to be a picture of a lemon. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, so uh, Free says, therefore, you have three alternatives. Either there are some statements you should accept without knowing the reason. Popper and perhaps Reese calls dogmatism, or infinite regress, right? Because if there is no statements that you can accept unless you know something that implies them, I guess I should be more careful about that. Either there's some statements that it's no, I guess no. I, okay. Either there's some statements that it's rational to accept, even though you don't know any reason for them, and that is dogmatism. Or if not, and you and you accept, you still accept that the reason for accepting a statement must be something that implies it, then the reason for accepting a statement must always be another statement. And that statement, you also have to have a reason to accept. And that reason also has to be another statement. And that's infinite regress. Or circularity. He doesn't mention circularity. Um, but um, sometimes you see an argument kind of like this where the three alternatives are dogmatism, infinite regress, or circularity. But I guess Fries and Popper just don't think circularity is in the mind, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's maybe they think it's just obviously irrational. I don't know. Anyway, so the third alternative, and this Popper says is the one that Fries itself accepts, the psychologism. So psychologism is the view that the reason for accepting some statements is not something that implies them. Not that we know something that implies them, but that we experience their truth. So the perceptual experience, and this is where Popper uses this word relatedness that I was talking about before, right? This is experience in a passive sense, something that happens to me. The perceptual experience is our reason for believing the statement or accepting the statement. And this cuts off the reason we rest because this is not a statement and we don't have a reason for it. It's just something that happens. Now, I guess you can have like, you know, a whole bunch of other alternatives of like lemonism, you know, the, like the reason for accepting some statements is a lemon. <laughs> and since a lemon is a statement, that cuts off the regress too. But I guess, you know, maybe that's. Those views are not very popular. So, yeah. <laughs> What's the distinction between like dogmatism and psychological? Psychologism. I feel like in psychologism, you're accepting certain statements based on your experience of them, which is irrational. It, of course, cuts off the, the chain of the inference. Huh? Well, I mean, so the claim is that it is rational, right? They're just saying it's a reason. It's a reason to accept the statement. So, dogmatism doesn't supply any reason to accept statements, or is it just a Umbrella term for any like non-inferential reason to accept statements. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, but like in, in other contexts, the word dogmatism can be lots of different things, right? But here, dogmatism means that there's some statements that you sh that you should, I guess, rationally accept, even though there is no reason, right? They're self evident That you might know? like have an instant of like other reasons to accept things like lemonism, you know? So because dogmatism implies that there is no reason. Right. Dogmatism apply. I mean, that's the difference between dogmatism and psychology and psychologism. But dogmatism says, look, there's just some statements that you have to accept. <laughs> psychologism says there's some statements that you have a good reason to accept, but the reason is not another statement that implies them, it's an experience. So Popper's claim is that, um, so, so Fries, first of all, as Popper describes him, goes for this. And that's why he says that, you know, Kant's system, which like Descartes' system seems to somehow be claiming to get, to get out of this. <laughs> like, like to give you some things where there is a reason for it and it, and it is a logical reason, but it still comes out of nowhere somehow, right? Like I exist, or you know, but anyway, that that uh Greece is saying, well, that you know, that's not possible. Right? You have to choose one of these, and, and this is the one that you really should choose, right? So when you talk about the form of our faculties and stuff like that, you're really talking about empirical psychological facts. Yeah. So like self-evidence would be like a little psychology. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I guess it depends what you mean by self-evidence. Yeah. If self-evidence means that you experience its evidence, <laughs> then it would be a form of psychology. Things like 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 Frege's act, like Frege's like axiom that things things like things sell like self-evident truths that kind of made the foundation of logic. Would that be like well, I mean, you mean according to Frege, like if, if you read his discussion of the axioms um, in the uh, the Griffith, it's not really clear. He does give an argument for them actually, um, but yeah, when I was a grad student, I had kind of an argument like this about Richard Heck. Who's, then knew and now still knows a lot more about Frege than I do. <laughs> he said that he said that Frege was a, effectively making a semantic argument and like drawing a truth table for each of the axioms. Whereas I said that it looked like Frege was trying to derive them from the principle of contradiction. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so I Yeah, I don't know what Popper would say about Frege. Frege was not very, so Carnap actually was one of the few people who went to attend Frege's lectures. Um, he said it was like him and one other person in most of the class. <laughs> the other person was like some retired army captain. <laughs> so anyway, so he, um, but yeah, Frege, uh, you know, Russell really liked Frege and, uh, and Frege kind of, I guess, partly by way of that, somehow got like, rediscovered at some point. But in any case, um, so I don't know if Paul was really thinking about Frege that much. But, um, Yeah, so like I said, it depends what you mean by self evidence. By self evidence, you could just mean they must be accepted. Just, and you can't ask for a reason for it. Well, like the principle about like identity A equals A. Is that, would that be self evident to you, Popper? Um, so Popper actually says that in the case of logic, no one nowadays still maintains psychology. By no one nowadays means like 
none of the people, none of his friends, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, um, but he says, strangely, when it comes to empirical science, people are still doing it, right? So, yeah, so I think, no, from his point of view, A equals A is um, true by virtue of its form, it's tautologous. I mean, in that case, it's literally a tautology, I guess. Is that like a dogma? No, so it's like it, it, it's uh, it doesn't have any theoretical content. It's just a, a linguistic convention. Oh, uh, which I'm only applies like empirically, empirically useful like sentences or things. Well, that's true. What I said is true. Maybe it's not the right thing to say here. Yeah. Because he says, like, you know, I mean, and maybe this is supposed to be independent of, think of that account of logic, that it's, that it's empty for that reason. He just says, no one any longer claims that our reason, that like a mathematical proof is valid because of the experience of conviction it causes in me when I read this. I mean, you know, in effect, that's exactly what this world claims about mathematics. <laughs> so that's why I said no one is maybe a little limited here, you know, but although Husserl is also very against psychologism, how does that go together? Well, Husserl says this isn't a matter of psychology, this is pure reflection. <laughs> anyway, all right, sorry, I'm getting kind of far afield from, from Popper here. So, 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 right, so getting back to Popper, so Popper says, um, but also, he says, Carnap basically has psychologism only just translated to the formal mode. Right, so instead of saying, like, um, there's certain experiences that are reasons for accepting certain statements, he says, you know, there's a certain class of safe statements that you don't need um, to write something else down first in order to justify writing these next. But which are they? Well, it turns out that they're the ones that are supposed to describe our fundamental experience, right? So it's basically a version of psychologism, is what Popper says. And you know, and he says that's definitely true in in the older versions of Carnap's theory. And then he's and then he has a footnote about Carnap's, you know, he says, I thank Professor Carnap for his kind words and his <laughs> right? because I mean you'll see why, because because Neurot does not have any kind words for Popper, <laughs> right? Whereas Carnap is like, oh, I've learned so much from Carl Popper. <laughs> So, right, so Popper says, you know, I thank Professor Carnap for his kind, kind, words, kind words, and, you know, it does seem like he has moved closer to my position, but I feel that, I fear that he still doesn't understand exactly what I mean. And the reason he fears that he, Carnap still doesn't extend, understand exactly what he means is that Carnap says, oh, yeah, we can accept a statement like, you know, there's a book on the table as a protocol sentence. Um, because, like, in most situations, it's convenient to stop there. Um, but he says if it's high stakes, then we might want to, then we'll want to fall back to the statement, like, you know, uh, at time T, Abe saw a book on the table. And then we're going to, like, examine Abe's brain or like, whatever. And Papa says, I think you don't understand because that's going in the wrong direction. What determines whether something is a good choice of an observable predicate is that it's relatively easy for us to all agree that it applies. So there's a book on the table meets that very well. Something complicated about my mental state doesn't meet that very well. <laughs> it's really hard to determine and to agree about that. Um, so that's what he takes that as a sign that Carnap is still somehow attached to psychologism, right? That in the you know the back of his mind, Carnap is saying, 
well, the real basic statements will have to be the ones that refer to my fundamental experience. And the copper is right that we don't always have to push it that far. Something like that. Um, I mean, you know, whether that's true about Carnap or not, in the end, Ray, like in the methodological status paper, Carnap proposes for the observation language that it consists precisely of statements like there's a book on the table. <laughs> or at least there's like a red and yellow rectangular prism made of paper, you know, something like that. Anyway, um, so, but the interesting thing, and I guess here is you guys, when you came in, were asking if I was going to say anything about. Uh, Popper's critique of Marxism. Well, here's the closest it comes in this reading, right? He says, Neurod, in fact, points to this. Why? Because um, Neurod says, uh, well, you know, um, basic statements are. Um, Okay, so psychologism says that basic statements can't be shown false because we've experienced their truth. Neurot says, no, basic statements can be shown false and deleted from our encyclopedia. Well, actually, I guess I shouldn't say be shown false. The point is, Neurot says, sometimes our encyclopedia will contain inconsistent statements and we'll want to delete one of them to get rid of the inconsistency. And Popper's claim, at least, is that Neurot um, can't specify any reasons for doing that. So that it just ends up being a, a matter of um, which basic statements we want to hold on to. And so Popper says that's a form of dogmatism. No, is that fair to Neurot? I'm not sure. Although the way Carnap put, I mean, Popper puts it is pretty funny because he says, therefore, against his will, Neurot was forced to throw empiricism overboard. Right? This is an allusion to that thing about the, the ship, right? Where Neurot says we have to build our ship while it's on the ocean, but only like metaphysics first will be completely eliminated, but then, you know, so Popper says, unfortunately, empiricism also got thrown off the ship. <laughs> so, yeah, and I mean, um, I do feel like the political difference between them has something to do with the fact that that is that accusation that's, that's being made against the right, whether it's clear or not. Um, Okay, well, he doesn't mention anyone who goes for this. I guess he might be Spinoza. But you're saying you understand Spinoza, so yeah, <laughs> not, yeah you might put Spinoza here. Spinoza thinks that like every state, every statement about finite things is you know proved by an infinite chain of entities <laughs> in the divine intellect. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but yeah, you know, Popper's not interested in that alternative, I guess. Um, so what about Popper? Which of these does he go for? And the answer is, he says, my view doesn't face this problem. Um, so, Popper says, we're, um, to not be dogmatists, we don't actually have to actually have to test all of our assertions, but we do actually have to be willing to test all of our assertions if the question should come up. So, um, so he says, you know, my view is kind of like dogmatism, because when we accept statements, we don't have a justification for that we're accepting these statements. We're just guessing, <laughs> is all we can say. Um, and even in the case of the singular statements, 
that's really all we can say. Right, that's what's maybe a little bit surprising. Even in the case of the observation statements, you know, um, first of all, he says, we can't report any observations without building in a theory. Which was the right theory? We guessed it was this theory. And moreover, we can't report any observations um, unless we can all agree what happened. <laughs> So when I report an observation, I'm kind of like uh, taking the risk of speaking for everyone. I'm making myself a spokesperson for everyone. And they might like disown me, basically. So, um, so again, it's basically getting a guess. Um, so, um, but what makes it different from dogmatism, Popper says, is that I'm willing to give up my guess under conditions which, I mean, so what I think become clear from all of this is that although to a limited extent you can specify what the conditions are, like more broadly speaking, you can't fully specify what are the conditions under which you'll be willing to give up your statement. Right, because it's like you don't know what kind of falsifying hypotheses that people might come up with, you know. Um, and certainly for singular statements, that's even more true, I think. So, you know, so like, I mean, you put it this way Newton, when he proposed his mechanics, didn't like didn't and probably couldn't have had in mind the particular way that uh, that Einstein you know, said they were falsified. So, you know, it is, it's not like Newton would say, oh yeah, I would give up on absolute simultaneity if we were found that, you know, light is electromagnetic radiation and it always travels at the same speed in the vacuum and blah, blah, blah. Like he didn't, he didn't know about any of that stuff and like it wouldn't have occurred to him that there was any alternative to absolute simultaneity probably. Well, I think it did occur to other people like Flynas and not to me. So, <laughs> um, right. So, but, you know, but he and his successors intended more generally to, like, to contribute to a method, according to Popper, to contribute to a method in which their theory would be tested. And they knew that. Um, um, and intended that it might be given up if it failed to test in the future. So, um, so that's why it's not dogmatism. It's also, Popper says, it's a little bit like infinite regress because, you know, so what makes it rational for me to guess something like there's a book on the table is that I'm willing to have it tested. So how can we test it? Well, you know, uh, does my hand go through it? <laughs> if it does, it probably wasn't a book. <laughs> it was probably a holy ram. Yeah. You know, so there's various tests we can carry out. It starts becoming coming into question whether there's really a book on the table. Um, and I guess for the community as a whole, who accepted my statement you can start testing you know is Abe a liar do we really do we have the motivation right there's all kinds of things you know so um so and you know but those tests will all be in terms of other basic statements right like i'll say you know oh the these the previously accepted basic statement there's a book on the table was falsified because it turned out that although it looked like there was a book on the table. When I put my hand there, it went right through it. <laughs> so, but when I put my hand there, it went right through it. It's another basic statement, which also is rational because I'm also willing to test that. And so on, ad infinitum, right? So it's like an infinite regress, but he says it doesn't have the problem of infinite regress in justification. These, these infinite future tests are not the justification for my statement. Justification for it, well, don't I have a justification? It's a guess, right? 
What makes it rational is that this infinite future series can be carried out as far as seems necessary. All right. Um, it looks like I'm out of time. Uh, I think I said almost everything that was important about this. I didn't get to discuss the analogy with, the, with trial by jury, which I think is really cool and raises interesting questions about how trial by jury works. <laughs> um, but there's no time for that. Maybe I'll talk about it next time. Um, anyway, I'll see you then.